QVC Quality Violent Cinema. Thank you for tuning in to Quality Violence Cinema. Uh, we have a special guest. Uh, we have Tyler from uh, Cult Collectible uh, joining us. Um, thank you for coming in. Um, we've been kind of like, uh, I've known kind of friends for a little bit. Um, I know we've been, I've been kind of busy and you've been kind of busy, but um, I know you kind of hit me up originally um, for that um, um, Gigi Allen um, book that I had that I was just happened to be posting and you're curious if I was selling. And then we kind of just connected from there. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, if you want to do kind of like an introduction into who you are and what you do. Yeah, so I run callcollectibles.org. It's kind of like, a, it's a bit of a hard one to explain. Um, <clears throat> so it's like a true crime murderabilia cult uh, memorabilia website. Um, I kind of sell artifacts, buy and sell items. Um, I do a lot of like podcast work now or with some museums and documentaries and stuff. Um, kind of like archive certain things. Uh, I sort of got my feet in a bunch of different doors. I'm always doing a lot of different projects. I just got back from California filming a lot of video content. Mm-hmm. Um, with Jonathan <clears throat> Doe. Drop with Jonathan Doe, yeah, and another YouTuber from down there. Um, so, you know, I kind of cross into the horror world as well, obviously with that a bit. I mean, we did an episode of, um, one. Uh, we did a horror kind of focused episode while I was down there. Um, mm-hmm. And I met him kind of through the extreme horror scene and, where it kind of it, it intersects with my stuff quite a bit, right? Because it's a bit mm-hmm. of it's sort of the extremity of true crime for like collecting, right? So, um, and with his movie, The Degen- Degenerates, that was you know very, based on a true crime story. So it's kind of all been intertwined. So I'm kind of like intertwined a bit with the counterculture world and uh, um, the kind of horror alternative world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's actually kind of funny. I um, I kind of got you. Um, and Jonathan into each other because Jonathan didn't uh, I had sent him um, a link to your website and mm-hmm. um, he'd gone been basically contacted you through that and then you know connected through that and which was actually kind of funny because I was going to originally reach out to you to do a, a pod and then I reached to Jonathan and was like oh I think about doing whatever and he's like oh yeah I already have one recorded I'm like I guess I'll just wait <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah fine, you know it was it was weird timing how it all worked because I, I had yeah. talked to you and I had known his stuff separately from before that mm-hmm. and then he bought some things from my site and i recognized the name and i was like oh that's hey it's you isn't it and then we we, we had uh, i had reached out to him before that but i guess it got lost in the fray somewhere lost in the spam right because we didn't mm-hmm. have any kind of um reference for who i was but yeah then that all started and kind of uh, uh we recorded some podcasts and and i've now finally done some video stuff together and uh mm-hmm. Here we are, and now it's come back to uh, back to you. Yeah, which I'm still down to do that original idea. What I was talking about is like getting you two together, and maybe you and Nico, and kind of doing like just kind of like a discussion type thing. Oh yeah, something. like a roundtable cool. thing for sure, mm-hmm. for sure. It's definitely cool to have um, like the different side, like people who are purely collectors, people who are dealers, people who kind of do both. You know, it's kind of cool to have all that different perspective at once, mm-hmm. and kind of feed off each other and learn yeah. from each other, maybe even too. For sure. So, um, so what got you into murder memorabilia collecting in the first place? Um, so I was really into, uh, uh, the Jonestown case ages ago. I thought it was super cool. I watched a documentary that kind of got me excited to learn more. And then as I was kind of doing research into it, I was like, well, I'm going to, you know, I can buy all the magazines and newspapers and the books and just get the full story and learn everything. Right. Uh, uh cause I was super interested in getting all the info. Uh, anyways, that went on, eventually um, sort of ran out of things to get, you know, there's only so many books that were published and some only so many documentaries made. So I started looking into like other things, like maybe are there novelty items? Are there are there items from the People's Temple? Um, mm-hmm. And I discovered that, you know, there had been an auction in the 70s where they sold all the assets from the San Francisco church. So some people had envelopes and stationery with Jim Jones name on them. And then I found out that they had recorded a gospel album. So there was a record out there too. And as I kind of just dove deeper into people's temple, I was able to find like more and more little items from their history. 
Um, once that kind of dried up, it got a bit harder to find stuff. I started looking at Heaven's Gate because I figured, well, I kind of like the thrill of the hunt to searching for these items. So I got really into Heaven's Gate doing that. Um, um, and then kind of the same thing when that slowed down a little bit, when there wasn't really much else I could look for. I looked into uh, the Branch Davidians from Waco. I looked into, um, you know, the Children of God, Tony Alamo, uh, Om Shinrikyo, every kind of cult you could think of, right? Um, mm -hmm. It kind of became a murderabilia collection that was purely cult focused. Uh, and then the more that, that happened, I was, I got to a point where I sort of had to rotate things out because I didn't have too much room. So I made Cult Collectibles, um, the site, just to kind of, uh, uh, share the collection online and sell some items and trade some items and network, right? Mm -hmm. The initial idea being I'll, you know, I'll cover the hosting fees every year with, with any money I make and just get to like trade stuff and build my collection up. But it just really kind of got um, picked up momentum mm -hmm. okay. to the point where Being lucrative. Like, yeah. Well, to the point where I would get, I, you know, I got people with bigger and bigger collections coming, talking to me, wanting to sell things and then consignment projects and it, yeah, as it expanded, I kind of learned of new markets and new things, new places to source from. Um, so, and so I went at the time I was selling on eBay full time as like a reseller doing um, just general collectibles, right? Um, yeah, and then it sort of took over. It, it it took over, and now it's the full time thing. And I've been branching out. I mean, over the past year, a lot into podcast stuff and interviews but more recently into video and YouTube and, and just anything I can to like kind of get the name out there and promote the name because um, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of value to the information that I have as opposed to just the tangible items. So I'm trying to um, market that a little bit uh, uh, as like almost a resource as well as a uh, uh, collectibles store. So how long has the site been up? Uh, it's been about three years. Yeah, I say it's been about three years that it's been up consistently running. Um, and at first, yeah, like I was saying, the first thing that kind of brought me there was uh, I, I had assumed I could sell some of that stuff through eBay, but they're kind of picky and choosy on what you can sell. Sometimes like a true crime magazine is OK, but another one isn't um, any of like the heavier stuff, the letters and paintings they're not really into. So I. Um, made the site while I was doing eBay. So I would have a spot for the items that I couldn't sell on eBay. And uh, yeah, like I said, the momentum just took off with that and it became to the point where I couldn't really do the eBay anymore if I wanted to keep doing call collectibles. Um, so in about three years, it's become pretty, pretty solid uh, kind of career. That's good. Yeah, have you ever thought about going back into eBay to selling stuff that's like not call related just to kind of sell stuff? Yeah, I still have an account. I still, uh, like, I most of the stuff that I would sell is from thrift stores, right? I was pretty much thrifting mm -hmm. full time and flipping things. And I still go out every once in a while. I'll find something that's cool and know that I could make some decent profit mm -hmm. on it, flipping it. Um, so I still have it just in case to sell the odd thing here or there, maybe a couple items a month. Um, but it's not anything that might get you taken down. Yeah, yeah. And even at the, at the time, I was worried because that was my full time job, right? I was like, okay, I don't want to risk my account because this is. This is how I pay my bills. This is everything. Now um, it's a really back burner thing. Um, it's very, yeah, now it's very, um, you know, it's there if I want to sell a couple, sell like some old inventory or like a, I find an old video game or something. But um, yeah, Cult Collectibles takes up pretty much all my time now. Are you worried about the Cult Collectible getting shut down? No, I don't. I There's no legalities about what I do. Um, if anything, it's a bit of a gray area in terms of like morality, but in terms of legality, there's no problems. There's been sites that have been up for way, way, way longer than I have, and they've never had issues. Um, even with like shipping things across the border internationally, I've never had issues either. Uh, I can't imagine it's at risk of, of anything like that, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think attracts people to collecting murder memorabilia? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I think it's just like the next step in, 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 in having an interest in true crime, right? Like it's almost a little more, um, it's a little darker, a little closer to the case. It's a little more morbid, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for people that are like, um, you know, watch tons of documentaries or listen to tons of podcasts and stuff. It, it's a way to like 
be closer to those crimes and also be safe. You know, there's safety in owning these things. It's not like you're interacting with these uh, uh, criminals or, or cults or whatever, right? And I mean, a lot of them aren't even active or around anymore. But yeah, I think it's people's way to <clears throat> get a, like a real tangible connection to that. And then um, I think that with any kind of collection, uh, the way that it kind of um, snowballs for people is that they they find the niche they're really into, like, oh, I want to just get cult stuff, or I want to just buy from this inmate, or I want to mm-hmm. have one piece from every notable case, right? Um, and it's an easy kind of collection. Like you can see even with your background there with your movies, right? I got the same kind of setup in my living room for, for films. Um, it's just like certain things come out and I'm like, oh, I want to get everything in this series or I want to get this mm-hmm. limited thing or, or I know this is going to be out of print soon. So I got to grab this one, right? Like it's, mm-hmm. uh, this, I think it's the same. Just... Pardon me? Being a completionist. You know, yeah. Yeah. It's too. the same kind of collector mentality as anything else. Um, I think it's just got a little more of a niche uh audience because it's a bit of a darker thing right Mm -hmm. yeah no i could definitely see that um so what is it about the heaven's gate that you find the most intriguing um well so i like i was really into heaven's gate because it was like it was pitched to me as like the star trek cult like like it was very aesthetically kind of inspired by star trek the next generation um, which I was a big fan of the show. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. That's really neat that they kind of stuck with that as their, um, as, as a bit of an inspiration. And they watched the show in the mansion. Uh, and then the more I looked into it, the more I realized that, you know, their suicides in 1997, the bunk beds and all the imagery with them with the Nike decades and the uniforms and the purple shrouds, all of that stuff was the very tail end of their history, right? They were founded in the 70s. And they weren't called Heaven's Gate until... Uh, I think 1995 is when they launched their website, maybe 96. Um, that was just the thing they used when they put their website out to kind of spread their message, right, at the end of things. Um, so I was interested in the fact that, you know, some people could go out there, and I'm sure I've tried to look for Heaven's Gate items, but probably not as many people have been looking for items from the 70s until, you know, the early 90s. Um, so that sort of motivated me to research the past and the history and sort of follow the trail of where they went along that time and who they interacted with and what kind of connections they made. Um, And I was able to find, you know, find things like old newspapers or uh, uh, there's some albums that Marshall Applewhite was the director of, he was a choir director. Um, There's all these little pieces from the pre, I guess, science fiction era of the group, right? Um, and it, yeah, it just turns into a wormhole where you can just go forever and ever and ever learning about the backstory of these groups. Um, so that one for me was very much based on the fact that I like wanted to piece together this entire history that no one's really put into a cohesive, uh, a cohesive format before you just get bits and pieces. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, what is the most expensive, uh, item that you've sold? That I've sold? Um, it kind of depends. Uh, um, I've had like individual sales that were really big that were like a, a lot of items, like 10 letters, 20 letters or whatever. Mm-hmm. In terms of an individual piece, um, I've had some really rare ones that went pretty high. Um, recently the, with this Jeffrey Dahmer stuff, I've been working in a big collection of Jeffrey Dahmer items. Um, that have never really been on the market before. There's only been maybe a handful of his letters out there for sale ever. And this is like everything, right? So I sold a few things in the, you know, close to $3,000 range, signed items. Um, In the past, I've sold, I sold an original wanted poster for the uh, Om Shinrikyo members who did the Tokyo subway attacks. That was pretty expensive because that's like that item. You can find Om Shinrikyo items with a bit of looking, but that specifically is like somebody would have in 1995 had to save that from a wall in a subway. It was tacked up. They took it down, took it home, put it away in storage and it kept it for this long. Um, and to have that kind of history with a piece, like really, um, it's something that, you know, it could be the only one that exists, you know, there isn't really anything else out there. So a lot of the value of this stuff is sort of based on kind of, I had to kind of make some stuff up, but it's, it's, based on, I guess, rarity and uh, uh, desirability, right? 
Yeah, I imagine it would come all from like one seller because it's like somebody that either how they got their hands on it is like obviously why they got all of that, like be it a prior family member or they're on the case or yeah. they happen to. So I can imagine like it's a lot of repeat of the same seller or the same group of sellers. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, how do you price your items? Um, like I was kind of explaining, it's sort of. Um, with some stuff, it's kind of based on what I pay for it, right? For instance, I know that certain letters sell for, let's say, for example, they sell for $100 a piece, right? Um, and if I am if I can buy one for $50 and I sell it for $100, I'm making a bit of profit because you have to take into account the fees and taxes and everything, the shipping. Um, what, what I prefer to do is buy large collections, right? Like somebody has, uh, you know, 50 letters at $100 each, and then I'm paying... Um, hopefully a little bit less than half of the value because I'm putting in a lot of work and time to sell that and it takes time to get that money back. But when it comes to like specific items, like there's some stuff without comparisons, right? John Wayne Gacy paintings, for instance, they sell quite often. You can kind of see what they're worth. Uh, something like a, um, like I have like an extension cord from the Heaven's Gate mansion, right? Or I have some glasses from the mansion. Weird things that you don't really know what people are willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of, everything's sort of based off of what I pay and how long I think it will take to sell and um, what I think the value is, right? Because if something's going to take a few years to sell, I want to make a little bit more on it because I'm waiting longer on the investment, right? Uh, but it, honestly, piece to piece, it's pretty, um, it's pretty much, I, I got to put a lot of thought into it, right? I got to make sure the business can keep running and that things can keep going forward. And I also got to consider that people um, have expectations for what certain things would cost. So I don't want to like overcharge anybody and I want to be able to be, yeah, be fair and give good deals, right? So it's kind of an ongoing thing with every single item. Yeah. Um, what are some items that you still, um, that you have your hands on or have your eyes on, sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, things that I want to get really badly. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to get one of the Heaven's Gate bunk beds. That's just like a, I mean, it's not super practical. It's pretty big, right? For shipping, even it would be a pain. Mm -hmm. But um, I know there's a couple in private collections. I know there's more out there that exist. There were, I think, 17 sold at the auction, and there's only a few accounted for. But I'd love to get one, even if I had it on the site for like a ridiculous price. It's kind of like a display piece. I think it would be cool. Mm -hmm. um, I've always wanted to get one of the Om Shinrikyo electroshock helmets. They had like these blue mesh helmets that were all handmade with electrodes on them. And they would use it to like shock their heads when they were meditating. Um, not just like a cool piece of that story. I've always wanted, wanted one of those. Um, um, because it's like, it's, it's, it's more unique than like one of the books they published for instance, right? Um, there's a lot of stuff that's just kind of like things that I've heard about from true crime stories that I thought would be really interesting. Like for instance, um, Armin Mivis, the German cannibal, right? Mm -hmm. He, I've got some stuff from his place, from his house. And um, something that always intrigued me is that he, when his victim was upstairs in the bathtub bleeding out, he went downstairs and apparently read a Star Trek novel. So I've always been curious, like which, cause there's a bunch of Star Trek books out there, right? Like which one it was, I'd love mm -hmm. to have that specific one. Uh, but I think even going to his place and looking through all his books, he might have had a hundred different Star Trek novels, right? So there's no way to really check with him and say, hey, which was the one you were reading at this time, you know? But those like specific pieces from cases like that, I always find really interesting when you have like a specific, <clears throat> sorry, a specific memory or moment um, from a case that stands out as a bit unusual and you can mm -hmm. find a piece related to that. Yeah, no, for sure. Like apparently like this, the singer of Joy Division had um, that score. Uh, I forget the name of the movie, but it's like guy in his accordion. It's like with him, the shotgun at the end of the movie on the Ferris wheel. And for some reason, they, you know, that was the movie that was playing when he shot himself. And so, mm -hmm. like, I was just thought like interesting facts like that, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those kind of connections are, are, are always like the most, the most uh, uh, cool to me. The the small details, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so are there sites or places to bid on Murder Room Velia? Yeah, there's, um, well, first of all, eBay, you can get things through sometimes. Generally, 
when you see something on eBay, it's like a newer seller. It's not somebody with a ton of uh, history on there because they kind of people who have like more established stores don't want to risk their accounts. Um, so you see things sometimes that go to auction or buy it now and get sold really fast or get through, kind of just fall through the cracks, right? It's still a good resource to look for stuff. Um, murder auction as well as another one is an auction site. Um, it's purely your murder billion stuff. I think it's a $10 fee to sign up forever to get an account for life. Uh, and you can like sell or buy on there um, via auctions. And I, I bought a few things in there in the past. I don't know how active it is of a site, um, but there's a there's a lot of cool stuff on there, a lot of rare pieces, which is which is uh, neat to see. Mm-hmm. Those are kind of the only two options: is getting lucky on eBay or going through um, murder auction. Yeah, and these are these probably good for you to price break and understand what you have to. For to sure. Like yeah, like I got to always. Serve. Yeah, I have to always look at other sites to make comparisons and figure out stuff like that. Have you ever thought about running a store, like a virtual store, like an actual one? Not a virtual store, but like a physical like a store. Uh, I mean, I, I, the closest I would think would could work is doing like a, a conventions, like horror conventions mm-hmm. or oddity expos. Um, and it, in which case, a sometimes I think my stuff's a little bit too controversial, and I don't know if I necessarily get through with everything. Um, but when, in terms of having a physical store, I just think there's not enough draw for it, right? I don't think there would be enough people that would happen to be in the city I'm in or whatever city I was in coming through every day to sustain the store and pay the rent. Yeah. The extra yeah. expenses yeah. and overhead and all that. Yeah. yeah. The overhead is, is wild for retail. So for this kind of retail where it's very specific niche items, I mean, my stuff sells all over the world, right? If I was selling every single item to people in my town, it may be worth it, but since it goes everywhere, uh, it's kind of better to have that reach of like, mm-hmm. Yeah, just entirely online and the cost basis is just based on like me paying my rent and so um so are there items that you wish you never sold no not really um uh, honestly i feel like at the beginning there were a lot of times when i would be i would want to hoard almost one item from every name and let's say if i only had one richard ramirez letter right somebody was really wanting one to be like well i guess i'll sell my personal one um and I would have a hard time parting with it, but I knew that I would get one eventually later on. And almost like when I get collections in and I pick personal things for myself that I want to keep, um, even if somebody really wants it at some point, I've always find something cooler down the road. Something else comes in that's always more interesting. Um, I, 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 I've done a good job at like disconnecting um, my, my hobby from my job, right? Because it's like, first and foremost, I got to run the business and me collecting and stuff is is on the side of that. So most of the stuff that I have now is, is kind of sentimental. It's like gifts from people or like items from like big collections that were cool to have worked with and stuff or like achievements in my, um, <clears throat> achievements in my career. Right. Um, I mean, I think the, probably the closest thing would be that Om Shinrikyo poster. Cause it was just such a cool item, but even so I have pictures of it, you know, and I have the story behind it and that's, that's cool enough for me. Mm-hmm. So what serial killers have you been pen pals with? I've written to, I haven't written in a while. I used, uh, uh, kind of when COVID started, I started writing a lot because I had a lot of free time. Um, and I've talked to quite a few people. I would, I, I'd say I've probably talked to about 75 different names. Um, some hope high profile, some and some are probably not serial killers, just you know, yeah, just crimes. crimes. I, there's been a few people that I've be, like become, I, I guess, become acquainted with and talked for quite a bit. Um, but yeah, it's been a while. I'd like to get back into writing those people specifically, and um, and for privacy's sake, like all the, all of all my personal stuff that I do like that, those are all they don't I don't sell those. I keep them private. Those conversations are all kind of private, you know, just because it's my it's like the part of the hobby that's. For me, you know, as mm-hmm. opposed to like for the site, a lot of people will write just to get letters and sell them, which is totally fine. But that aspect of it, at least right now for me, is like my, that's like my um, fun little uh, private piece of, of this job. Mm-hmm. What are some recent cases that you've collected on? Uh, recent cases. Uh, I mean, I, I, whenever there's a case that's big enough, if we're interesting enough, I try and get a few things for the site. Um, like Chris Watts, for instance, Jody Arias, they're two bigger ones as of recent. I like to always have a few things on hand from them. 
Um, Chris Chan, I don't know if you know the cool Chris Chan story. Um, they were like the most documented person in history of over like thousands of hours of footage online. Um, and then they had some criminal dealings recently and, and that kind of turned into a bit of a true crime case as well as a counterculture thing. Um, yeah, whenever there's some, it, it kind of depends on what it is because certain things like, let's say there's a mass shooting, there's, you know, they make memorial t-shirts and there's a lot of stuff out there. But if it's just like some random murder case, it's sort of hard to um, find things right away. You know, sometimes it'll get into a magazine and you can find a magazine and buy that. Um, but yeah, a lot of the times you just kind of have to um, wait and see if that person starts writing letters, you know, or doing art in prison and selling that. Um, and then if other collectors are getting that and putting it onto the market. Uh, so there's never anything specifically that happens where I'm like, well, I need to try and find things from this right now. But it's kind of like uh, as soon as things start coming up on the market that seem interesting, um, relating to something new, I'll try and uh, uh, kind of get it in the shop just so I have that variety. Collecting for the potential yeah. future, you know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, are you still printing the serial killer trading cards? <clears throat> oh, sorry. Um, no, I was doing that for a while. I did four of them. I did each one. I kind of wanted to make it to like an interesting project. Like I did um, Roche Theralt and, and uh, or Rock Theralt, sorry, of the, the Ant Hill Kids. It was a Canadian cult. And then Shoko Asahara because they were just sort of like lesser known cult leaders. I thought it would be cool to kind of get their story out a bit. Um, and then I did Nico Klo. Uh, I did a painting of him and he signed the cards. And then I did um, Armin Mivis, and it was the art was done by Nico uh, for that one. I, I, essentially, what I was trying to do so the Eclipse two time trading cards for anyone who doesn't know, they were like done in the nineties. There were two sets. They were really cool, super cool kind of watercolor art. Um, and they, yeah, they had two two sets, but stopped after that. And there there haven't been modern cards. And people have done different kind of true crime cards since then. But I really like that style and that look of those ones oh sarah aldrett i also did recently and she signed those ones um another kind of lesser known cult leader but yeah aside from that little one off recently i haven't really done many just because it's, it's a lot of work it's a lot of time to do the art and uh digitize it all edit it get them printed get them back from the printing place and honestly they don't sell great you know they're like they're cool i like to have them as like throw in items right but a lot of the stuff when I make original items, stickers or small things like that, they're not really good sellers. They're just like cool things for branding and to kind of throw in, right? So it ends mm -hmm. up being a lot of time investment and I'm uh, not making the money back on it, um, which is fine when I have free time. But when I'm really, really busy with work and, and kind of hustling, like I don't really have time to do the, uh, the fun side stuff as much. Is there any other side projects that you did do? Like I had an idea of like a, like a serial killer calendar where you could do like have markings of certain murders or, or the birthdays mm. of each serial killer can be marked on the calendar. Or, yeah. You know. I think Nico's done calendars before. Oh, okay. Um, which are cool. They're like, like original art and stuff. Um, I, I get ideas all the time for like little things. Like, I mean, even with my merch, when I do a shirt, it's a bit of work that goes into that. Um, yeah, and I had, like, I made little miniature Heavenscape bunk beds for a while. I made, like, a little run of those. They're sold out now. Mm -hmm. I made a run of um, the um, juvenile crime. Yeah, I house. have. Oh, right. I'll bring it really. Hold on one second. Mm -hmm. Just to showcase it, some of that you can talk about. Huh? Those mm -hmm. things. <laughs> yeah, so I did those. I, those are, like, just a quick little one-off fun project. Like, they don't really tend to make money they don't really tend to be a big thing um yeah but it's good it's like a creative outlet right it's fun to do <laughs> so whenever i get like an idea where i'm like oh that'd be kind of fun uh, uh i just bang it out um uh yeah but they kind of come to me as time goes on right i think the last one that i did that i really enjoyed it was the pogo the clown replica button set it was like mm -hmm. a set of three small buttons that were the same ones that john wayne gacy had on his clown suit um, I had someone like redo the art for those and uh, like nice little packaging on that. Um, now I had those Heaven's Gate Hatchet Man 
uh, pendants, necklaces. But yeah, those are kind of like when something pops into my head and I'll do something. But it's um, that's sort of the fun part of my business, you know, the, as opposed to the this. Sometimes I've got to like grind and just do some serious stuff and get the work out. So. Are you still doing any of the VHS ripping like serious? Because you had that one where you had them numbered and you're kind of having them like kind of seem like they were following a thing. Are you going to yeah. continue that? Yeah. Well, so I. Um, the main focus on those was the Issy Sagawa films, right? Because a lot of his stuff never really came out of Japan. And I was able to find a few of he had a couple things get released on DVD out here. And then the things that didn't, I tracked down VHS copies of a few of them. Um, one of his videos, I still haven't been able to find. It's like, it seems to be the most rare and expensive one. Um, that's like a goal to get that and to do a release of that for the next one. I kind of put it on pause until that kind of shows up because it's, um, it's yeah, it's, it's not like a thing where I can go on every single day and look for it. Like I got to kind of wait for it to come to me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had some other ones I had, for instance, the um, massacre in Milwaukee, which was uh, it's like five hours of raw news footage from Dahmer's arrest filmed off of TV in Milwaukee. Uh, and it was recorded about the time. Or it was recorded. Um, with all the commercials intact and everything, right? So it was really cool to get like what it would have been like to actually watch TV at that time in Milwaukee and see that. Mm -hmm. um, I had those ones. I had also an episode of the Om Shinrikyo anime. Some of those have been released online, but the VHS that I was able to get was an episode that hadn't been released before. Um, but those are all, yeah, all of those things are kind of, I got lucky and the items came up and um, uh, like the Dahmer one was just a random tape in a lot of books that I bought online. Uh, the other ones I had to find in Japan, which is pretty expensive. So when something comes up, I'll grab it, but it's, it's a hard thing to go out and source for specifically and to look for. Um, a lot, that's the reason that I kind of always have so many projects going on at once because I, um, I know that certain, if I'm looking for a specific thing, I'm not necessarily going to find it, but if I'm involved in a whole bunch of different things then it's more likely that one of those things will come through. Right. So mm -hmm. I feel like that was just collecting DVDs. Like I've, I've had a lot of people sure. that now have become friends with are like, Hey, I, I want to sell this to you first before I pitch it to people, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff, sure. which is always nice to be at that point. Mm -hmm. um do you still collect uh any rare japanese vhs besides you know those ones you want to rip uh I, I don't specifically go to my way to i mean i i keep my eye on auctions all the time um if i ever find something that's a good deal or a i think is like super interesting i'll pick it up but for the most part um in terms of my like horror collection it's all dvd I, my, mm -hmm. my horror collection and like just it's just mixing with all my other stuff right because i'm a pretty big film nerd um but it yeah mostly dvd and blu-ray just because um it's you know it's easier to store it's easier to watch uh, mm. uh tends to degrade less um i have like a, a couple of men behind the sun on vhs i think but yeah i don't really um hunt for anything specific i just if i ever see a deal where i know oh that would be a cool thing to have for a while and maybe once it leaves my collection i can make a little profit then i i'll, I'll pick it up but I'm not really hunting uh, actively too often for tapes. Did you own both the concrete and juvenile crimes on VHS or was it just juvenile crimes? Uh, I have. It's weird, actually. I just bought a copy. You know, it's funny. I just bought a copy of concrete on the way. Um, oh, cool. Which I didn't even know was on VHS, right? It came out in 2004. So I guess it was right on the end of that. I assume it's, you know, Japanese without subtitles, but it's still kind of a cool collector's piece, you know? Mm -hmm. somebody's going to be interested as a collector piece i just got that because it's true crime adjacent you know it kind of fits for the site so it's a cool thing for inventory mm -hmm. um i did a did a bit of an order from japan recently so i could do an uh, uh an unboxing because i just started the youtube so i want to get a little content for that going just to promote the site a bit um yeah so i had that on the way i and you know, i had a copy of juvenile crime that um uh sold quite a while ago but yeah, it's a, it's an expensive one to get. Yeah, I think uh, somebody was actually trying to sell me that copy, and I almost bought, but but I wasn't mm -hmm. sure on who it was. And then they mentioned it was from you. I was like, no, mm -hmm. it probably was legit, but whatever. <laughs> um, so uh, do you digitally archive anything? Uh, yeah, I have a lot of stuff kind of backed up. That's um, 
uh, I work with some documentaries and stuff, so I've got some projects in the works right now that I can't get into, but uh, I have to back things up, scan things, and, and rip things for that. Um, yes, and that kind of stuff can, I think once everything's all done with those things and they come out, I'm a lot, I'm, I can sell the original tangible items, which is cool. And it mm -hmm. sort of will back it up to being like, yeah, this was featured in this documentary or this series, right? Um, I, I was doing that a lot more at first, you know, where I was making prints and replicas of things and uh, uh, archiving like rare movies and stuff. But I've um, slowed down a bit now just because I'm doing so much work stuff that like kind of the hobby aspect of it has to be on the back burner for a little bit. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, I get that. There's like so much on the digital side that I do that I just need to work, but I've been doing on this podcast and I need to organize yeah. some shit. Um, so what exactly do you have planned or what are some ideas you have for the YouTube? Uh, so I, I basically made it because when I was going out to California, I was meeting up with Jonathan Doe and one other guy to film some stuff. Um, uh, I had a guy in between also get in touch and he's like hey you want to get tattooed by me and i was like yeah for sure so i was like well i'm doing all these things i might as well take a bit of video i have like a vlog that came out a few days ago that's just kind of showing a little brief view of what happened down there yeah i watched um, that. i yeah i figured it would be good to start uh capturing that kind of stuff when i'm doing those projects you know or even mm -hmm. like the deep diving into some of the items in my collection um i've got like a a, a trading card pack opening coming out in a bit i've got a few scheduled things on my youtube right now um i've got a video that's going to break down the uh uh lost heaven's gate website it was like a, a a secondary website made by somebody else who was a former member that was up during the 90s for a small period of time um and i've got like cd rom backup so i kind of did a tour of that a lot of people haven't seen that um and then i've got some clips from the jeffrey Dahmer news footage that I've cut up and some clips from the Om Shinrikyo anime. Like I've got the, the intro separated, right, and put on there. Uh, I'm trying to just, like, yeah, take some things from my personal collection of old footage and, and anything interesting and put it out there, as well as um, produce some new content that's, it's, it's basically completely um, based on promoting the uh, site, right? Mm -hmm. Like I just really want to promote the site and get the name out there more for there, because it's essentially free advertising doing youtube it's not costing me money to put anything there right uh and then if anything gets bigger or anything happens like that who knows maybe it'll it'll shift a bit but for now it's just going to be like yeah if i get a big box of cool items in i'll do an unboxing or if i get a um something super unique i'll just do a little a little explanation of what it is or show off items that maybe mm -hmm. uh, uh on the site would be hard to capture in pictures that people would want to see a video of you know yeah are there any you'd want to pitch right now um, cause I'm kind of be kind of closing right, um, pretty close. So I was mm. just seeing if you want to do like a, uh, showcase your site and any big items you're trying to sell or just want to showcase. I mean, like, honestly, I have so much stuff in my office and it's such a mess here <laughs> that I didn't even know where everything is. Um, oh, okay, sorry. but for anyone, oh no, that's fine. For anyone watching though, if you want to check out callcollectibles.org, um, or look up call collectibles on Instagram and YouTube, um, that's where I post, Instagram is where I post most of my like new stuff and keep people updated on things. YouTube, I've been doing some new content uh, uh, that should be interesting coming out. And then the, the site, yeah, if you're interested in purchasing, purchasing anything, I've got like all kinds of stuff, you know, from like cheap packs of trading cards and prints and photos to letters to paintings, all the way up to like, you know, personal items owned by Jeffrey Dahmer. So if you're into the kind of, um, uh, if you're into, um, true crime at all if you got if you're bored with your horror collection and want to expand a little bit <laughs> please uh please check it out yeah no yeah well thank you very much um yeah I'm, thank I'm you just wanted to close it out there but yeah um I, like i'm saying i'm really stoked to possibly do some more things with you um sure. so to see what you do with jonathan doe mm -hmm. um and anything else you have coming out in the future so great thanks so much yeah yeah thank you